So I would like to thank Muhammad and his entire team to invite me for this seminar and uh, I'm glad to be here. The plan is to spend about 45 to 60 minutes on the presentation and if you have any questions later on or you can uh, stop me in between uh, and maybe 10-15 minutes of Q&A and then we'll close. So we'll spend ab about overall 60 to 70 minutes on the seminar. So I'd like to start, uh, this is me, Sanjeet Roy, and uh, at the moment I'm an associate professor uh, in the Department of Marketing at University of Western Australia. But before I start, I would like to pay my regards and my, my homage to my ex, a late supervisor, Dr. A.K. Rao. And I must tell uh, this because if he was not there, I was not here, it was not possible for me to make any meaningful contribution in the academic world. So he held my hand and he taught me how to do research and held my hand all through my PhD days. It's a shame that he passed away in January 2020 and I could not see him, but um, I always feel his presence and his guidance always is with me when I guide my own PhD students. So I pay my regards to him. And with that, I'll start. Yeah, my research interests primarily are in the areas of uh, marketing of services. So that is what my PhD thesis was also in that space where I did some work in the space of customer loyalty and customer advocacy in the telecom sector in India. And uh, the impact of new technology, now I purposely use the term new technology because artificial intelligence, robotics, machine learning, these are certainly novel technologies and how they are impacting marketing in general and services in specific is something that interests me a lot and we are doing quite, quite a good number of ongoing projects. We hope to see them in publication maybe two to three years down the line. And another area of interest again related but uh, uniquely different and that is transformative service research through the lens of uh, well-being and subjective well-being and psychological well-being of the service entities involved in the service phenomena. So these are some of the key research areas that I spend my time myself with my team and my doctoral students as well. So let me start with uh, a, a recent paper that appeared in International Journal of Research in Marketing by Roland Rust. And that was very recently, a couple of months ago. And in that paper, Roland Rust was mentioning that there are three major forces that are changing the face of marketing and he calls is the future of marketing is driven by these three forces. And one of the primary forces that he foresees is technological trends, which are greatly impacting marketing, socioeconomic trends, which are again impacting how we understand, how we apply marketing in the present times and in the times to come. And of course, the geopolitical movements or geopolitical trends. But for the today's purpose, our agenda is to spend time on technological trends. So most of the discussion in the next 45, 50 minutes will be on the technological trends and how these technological trends are impacting marketing in general and specifically the services marketing and service management. In the same paper, he says that there are three long-term technological trends that are impacting marketing and services and one of that is like how companies or it is enhancing or increasing the ability or the capability of the firms to communicate with customers so firms have the capacity or the ability to to reach you anytime anywhere via the the social media platform or the mobile platform or whichever so they have the means to reach you anywhere they want they again have the increasing capacity to collect and store data. When I say store data, it's the customer data. And again, they have the capability to analyze that data utilizing machine learning, deep learning technologies and the methodologies that are now increasingly becoming more and more powerful. So these three technological trends that Roland Russ foresees, which has the biggest uh, or the scope is to impact services in future and marketing as well. So communication, collection and storage of data, 
customer level data and analysis of that data. Now, what is unique about this is it is helping companies to deepen their relationship with the customers. So the more I know my customers, the scope of building or creating long term relationship or deep relationship with my customers is enhanced and the service sector in a whole is getting expanded. So all of these abilities has positive impact if utilized well by the firms in the long run. So today's talk is primarily on the impact on one specific phenomena in services marketing, and that is service encounters. So service encounters is like one of the foundational constructs in services marketing. So we will specifically discuss about how these technological trends, how these newer technologies are changing this foundational premise of services marketing that is service encounters. So most of our discussion will revolve around service encounters. Now, those of you are who are has interest in services uh, management or services marketing literature, will come across some synonymous terms. So in, in addition to service encounters, terms like touch points are regularly used terms like interactions, terms like moments of truth. So these are some of the terms which are synonymously used. If you try to get under the skin and try to tease out the, the typical differences, you can, but loosely in most of the textbooks, most of the research papers, these are often used interchangeably, although there are some differences that exist if we dig deeper into the literature. But for the purposes of this presentation, we will use service encounters, touch points and moments of truth synonymously as we go on. Now let me take you back to one specific encounter, like say a bank encounter. So most of us do banking activities or we interact with our banks and do our financial transactions or whatever. So let me take you back to my dad and how my dad does his banking, how, how he involves himself into his banking encounter. So he is in his 70s, spending his retired life, a very happy retired life. I'm very jealous of him that when I become old and I become retired, then I must have a, as good a retired life that my dad is having. But how does he do banking? Now, you, this picture explains very clearly that he believes in the traditional banking encounter. So he still finds time to walk to a bank teller and he still finds time to write a checkbook and he still withdraws and deposits money. That is the primary banking transaction that he is involved in the traditional way that we know banking was done, say, 20, 30 years ago. How many of us go to banks these days? Like I went to uh, one bank when I came to Australia, I went twice to my bank. Once when I went to open the account and second when I went to close the account. For three years, I had that account in one Australian bank. Those were the two, two occasions that I visited. So we don't need to visit a bank. And that's a massive, massive difference when it comes to banking transactions and the way banks and customers interact. Now, that is my dad. Now, think of me. How do I bank? How do I engage with my banker? How do I engage with my financial services provider? So how do I bank? I bank on my couch. So I have my, my tablet, I use a credit card or debit card or whatever, and I may not need a debit card these days. I may use my app. So I mean, I, I, I like this bank. I have no inhibition in saying that this is the best bank I have ever banked with in Australia and rest of the world that I've lived in. This is a, a bank in Australia called Bankwest. They are so technologically well-rounded bank. I just love them. I just like them, right? So that's, I use their app. So I don't need a card. Everything is in my mobile phone. So there was a long time ago, there was a paper in Harvard Business Review. They said brand in hand. So everything is on your palm top, right? They have gone a step further. You don't need an app or you don't need a card when you want to go and buy something. Suppose I want to use my credit card to make a transaction at a retail store. So there are two or three options that you have. You can use a near field communication technology. You just wave your card and the transaction happens. Or if you have the card on your app, you can just wave your phone and the transaction happens. What Bankwest has done 
they have star, uh, uh, created or innovated a halo ring. So they call it a halo ring. So it's a beautiful ring. You can see this man is wearing a ring where I'm pointing the pointer. So this ring, especially, it costs around $39 if you want to have one. And that ring has all the information that your cards will have. So you don't need to carry your card. You just tap tap twice and your transaction happens. Of course, there is a maximum cap on how much can you do a transaction one uh, uh, on one to, uh, a tap. So what so this is a classic difference between how my dad who is in 70s and I will not tell you my age. I do my banking, right? So they, what is what is there for us, the service researcher, when we have these two scenarios? So one scenario is this, and the second scenario is this. What do we have to take it from here when we apply this in the services literature, right? Now let me take you to service encounter 1.0. So the service encounter, so let's start from the start or from the beginning. The service encounter, this whole idea of service encounter started with one scholar uh, uh, by the name of Shostek. So Shostek initially created this molecular model of service encounter. And from there on, we have Parashuraman Zit Mulberry, Mary Jo Bittner, and there's a whole heap of scholars in that space who have uh, spent all their lifetime to do research in that space of service encounter. But service encounter 1.0, how does it look like? Now, as a marketer, most of the marketers, and I'm sure there are some marketers in the crowd, in, in the audience today, every marketer likes either a triangle or a two by two matrix, right? So we love our triangles as a marketer. We love our two by two matrices. So let me take you uh, to one of the triangles that service marketers like a lot, and that is called the service triangle. So I take that as a premise to understand service encounter 1.0. As I said, I'll keep it very simple, very layman-ish kind of approach in this presentation, no technical ideas at all in the presentation, right? So I'm looking at service encounter 1.0 through the lens of value creation. Now, those of you who are interested in value creation, 1989, Harvard Business Review, there was a beautiful article by Trichy and Weir Sema. They talk about value creation through three perspectives. Right. So if you're interested, you can go. But we are not going there. We are saying that in the context of service encounter, in the context of interaction, how or who creates value? So if you look into service triangle, they say that there are three basic stakeholders who are at the three ends of the triangle, the customer, the employees and the service company or the service firms. And what happens is as a result of this interaction between these three parties, value is created. For example, let us look at first one. So when you are interacting between the customer and the company, there is some sort of a traditional marketing interaction, which we label as external marketing, which Gronrus calls as Christian Gronrus calls as making promises. So for example, in the previous scenario that we gave you, what is the fundamental promise that a bank makes to its customers, right? The fundamental promise that a bank makes to a customer is, I keep your money safe. So if I've deposited my lifetime savings, for example, my dad, so he's a retired person, he has uh, deposited his provident fund. So in India, we call it provident fund. In Australia, we call it super fund. So he has put his provident fund in a bank and every month he goes and takes his money and uses. So the primary job of the bank is to keep his money safe and give him some return depending on what type of instrument he has chosen, right? So that's the fundamental promise, and that's what marketers or service marketers call as external marketing. So it's not enough to make promise. So that's one way of creating value for your end user, like my dad, right? Now, you need to facilitate the promise. So if I have promised you that I will keep your money safe, when my dad walks into the bank, he needs to be treated well. Someone needs to greet him. Someone needs to help him. Right. He's not so good in English. So someone needs to help him to write the check in English. So all of these enabler type of a job or facilitator type of a job is the job of the employees of the people at the teller counter. Somebody who is at the help desk. There is some sort of a human intervention needed where you need to enable that promise because he needs the money to pay his bills for the rest of the month. And he wants to go and you know who helps him that we call as internal marketing, where there is a relationship between employees and service firms. So there is an interaction. 
sorry, I just moved a little bit away from this particular thing. This internal marketing is primarily the interaction between employees and service firm. So how does the service firm take care of their employees? That and in, in the present environment, so I'm not talking about COVID, I'm still there in a bank, in a financial services sector. What am I doing as a, as a service firm to retain my employees, to keep my employees happy? Because that is the, the, the part of the Intel because employees enable the value proposition or the promise. And the, the point that I just skipped on to a little fast forward is that interactive marketing. So when he goes to the bank, he needs some sort of a help and that help is given by the employee who is the interface between the customer my father and the company the bank so who is that interface and the critical interface is the employees this is a traditional service encounter framework that any typical service researchers come across so there are three critical components to this service encounter 1.01 1. you make a promise two you enable the promise three you deliver the promise and if you look at General Services Marketing recently published a, a note by, from Christian Grondrus, which he says that the future of services marketing is about the promise theory. And promise theory is not new. It's there in the marketing literature for the last 30, 40 years. But I can see there is a lot of talk around that promise theory and promise management. And of course, coming from Christian Grondrus kind of puts a, a lot of emphasis on that theory that promise management needs a strong presence in the domain of services marketing, services management. So that's service encounter 1.0. Fast forward. Service encounter 2.0. Now it's me. So when we started, we gave you two scenarios. One, my dad, how he banks. That is primarily a service encounter 1.0 kind of a scenario where I walk into a bank, I do a traditional banking activity. Fast forward 20 years, I'm an adult, I started working, I have started banking, how do I bank? And what are the changes that are happening, right? I'm still with the same triangle. As I said, marketers love triangle, I love my triangles. And I've adopted this, this figure from an article uh, by Rod Brody and his colleagues in marketing theory. And what is the change that has happened? between how my dad was banking and how I am banking. The biggest change is the technology and what technology or what type of technology is coming into the financial services sector. And if you look at this, what happened to this one? That technology is impacting every arm of the service triangle. So let us say technology is impacting interactive marketing. How my dad is getting help from the employees. Possibly he may not take the help of a technology. He still wants a human to help him. But when it is me, I don't want to talk to a human employee. I'm happy to talk to an app or I'm happy to use a banking activity using a mobile app or a mobile phone or or or, or ATM machine or whichever technology you can think of. Think of technology which affects the external marketing, how the service firm or the bank interacts with the customer directly. The, the traditional marketing activities are also impacted by technology. The internal marketing activity, how I deal with my employees, how I fulfill my employees requirements, all of that, or how I interact with them, my employees are also affected by technology, different forms. So I'm te using technology as a generic term. I'm not using any specific type of technology when I'm presenting this, right? So every arm of the service triangle is being affected by technology. It could be any technology. It could be a mobile app. It could be artificial intelligence. It could be service robots, it could be social robots, it could be machine learning, it could be any, it, it could be a simple application on your mobile device, but all are different facets of, this, of the same thing that is technology. But the real thing is that if the technology affects all of these dimensions or all of these, uh, these, these aspects of service triangle positively, we create value, right? If one of these arms or one of these effects become negative, then we don't create value. We are on the verge of destroying value, right? 
So let us stick to value creation and see what sort of values that these technologies are creating. So let us assume that technology is impacting interactive marketing, internal marketing and external marketing positively. So if you are interact in affecting all of these positively, then the company or the service company is creating value in terms of seamless customer experience. Now, for example, now there was a time, let me take you back to 2008. 2008, I was living in Boston. Uh, I was a visiting scho a scholar at uh, Bentley University, and I had to send money to my parents every month. So I used to get a stipend out of that, a small portion I was sent to my parents. How will I send money? That was the big question. It's a problem for a customer, right? So I was looking for avenues to send money. And I found there are companies like Western Union, there are companies like MoneyGram. And at that time, you had to walk into a, a, a corner shop, there will be a convenience store, and there will have some sort of a facility where you fill out a hard copy form, you give all the details of your parents, bank account details, everything, and then they will log every detail in the computer and the money goes in the next 24 to 48 hours. That was 2008, right? What happens now? Uh, even now, say my parents are retired and still sending money back home to my parents. How do I send money back home, right? What do I do? I don't need to fill a form. I don't need to go to a, a, a corner store or a convenience store. What do I do? I just need either a MoneyGram app or a Western Union app. I log in. I choose the amount to send, I choose the who is the recipient, and the money goes in 10 minutes, just 10 minutes. That's what I call a seamless customer experience. So my bank account in Australia is connected to that app, and through that my bank account in, uh, in India is connected, which is connected to my father's bank account. So there's a seamlessness, and this is the beauty of this new technology. It brings seamlessness in the whole game of customer experience management or customer relationship management. So that's how I create value for my customers. I make it convenient. Now to send the money to my parents in 2008, it will take me quite a long time to process this whole thing and get the money. And then I wait whether the money has gone safely or not. I had other options. I can go to Bank of America, but Bank of America will charge me a fortune so if I'm sending $500, possibly I, I, they will charge me about $80 or $100 to send this money because of the, So there's a lot of inconvenience attached to it. But as a result, if technology is used properly, we have an opportunity to, to create value for my end user. I can make it a personalized service. And there are cl n number of examples. For example, all of us buy insurance products today. Times are not far that insurance products will be personalized depending, for example, I'm a very bad driver, right? So if someone use a machine learning algorithm on my driving history, then it will be very hard for me to get a, a cheap insurance product for my car, right? So they will always sell me a high cost insurance product depending on my driving history. But someone who is a good driver, who has a beautiful driving history, may get a good product when it comes to a value for money product when it comes to insurance. So that's personalized service. I enjoy enjoyment. Societal benefits are already there. It, for example, now in this pandemic, coronavirus is there. Australian government recently launched about a month or two months ago, something called COVID app. So you download the app and it has its mechanism where you can do contact tracing and it will kind of show you if someone in your vicinity has some sort of a, uh, this virus or not. So that, that has some sort of an indication that this technology might have or has societal benefits. It's not might, it has if utilized properly, right? However, the other part is if we don't use the technology properly, then we are not creating value. We always have the opportunity to value destruction or destroy value. Why does it happen? Then the positive effect is turning to negative effect. Right? So if technology is misused or not used properly, if you deceive customers, if you deceive your employees, then value is not created. Now, there is a long history of research in, in services where we say a happy employee makes a happy customer. So if anyway, technology has a negative impact and it makes my employees unhappy, then 
following the service profit chain framework, it is legible to conclude that an unhappy employee more often than not will create an unhappy customer, right? So technology will have a negative impact. If it has a negative impact, it may destruct value. But how? How would it destruct value? For example, so privacy issues. Now we had a personalization. So this paradox is always there. So personalization and privacy paradox. So there are always privacy issues. So we gave you an example of COVID app. So the moment I have the COVID app, I'm getting the benefit, but the benefit comes at the expense of giving out data about my movement or my mobility data. Where am I going? What am I doing? My, all my movement history is in the government database. So if the government uses it judiciously, and I'm sure they are doing it, but if there is a company who has all these data for me and who does not use it judiciously or properly, then there is issues. So there are issues of privacy, there are issues of secrecy. The other day I asked my son, why don't you disconnect this Google? What is that Google Home Mini, right? It's lying, he was so excited. He wanted to buy a Google Home Mini. And after 15 days, it became just one piece of element lying in one corner of the house. I said, why don't you disconnect it? Who knows who is listening to me? You never know who is listening to you on the other side of Google Home Mini. So that is a problem with this advanced technology, and that's what we capture in the this idea of negative effect. So if there is someone who is listening to my conversation, to my bedtime stories with my kids, then it's not a very pleasant situation. There are financial and societal costs involved as well, time and effort involved in the use of technology, right? So there are always two sides of it. So technology brings wealth of benefits for the customers, for the society. But like every coin has two sides, along with the benefits, it also brings a set of negativities, a set of issues that needs to be dealt with. And companies have the ability to do this. Now, I would request you to read this new book uh, by Tom Davenport called The AI Advantage. I just finished reading the book by, from MIT Press. It's called the AI Advantage. It's such a nicely balanced perspective about the role of AI in business and society, the positives, the negatives, what it can do, how companies can implement, so on and so forth. So anybody who is interested in to, to look at AI and how AI can be strategized in a company, in society, by governments, that's a beautiful piece of work by Thomas Devonport. So what's the role of technology? So what do we, we, we gain now? At least we see that technology has both the sides, the positive and the negative. But what are the primary roles of the technology that we have discussed so far? Now, if you look at it, there was a recent paper by Bart Larvier and his colleagues. And in that paper, they talk about three roles, augmenting, substituting, network facilitating. I just added one more rule which I call it as transformative. So augmenting, of course, technology has the this tremendous ability to augment or add value to the existing service product, right? For example, a hotel, a hotel service. Now technology can go beyond the traditional hotel service and add value to it or augment the abilities of the service employees, right? And the, the biggest danger is it also has the capacity to substitute the frontline employees. You think of Airbnb, Ola, Uber, and all that kind of platform based companies where their network is the, uh, the facilitator, where the technology acts as a facilitator of the network. But technology also has a transformative, a massive transformative effect when it comes to the societal well being, community well being, well being of the customer, well being of the employees. If used properly, it has a massive, massive transformative effect, change the lives of people. For example, let me put this in perspective and just to use those triangles and those interactions to show you some examples of uh, a typical technology. So artificial intelligence is one type of a technology. So how AI enable service encounters look like? What are some of the examples? So this is taken from the second edition of Handbook of Service Science. Uh, there is one chapter, I'm forgetting the name of the chapter, but this is certainly from that book uh, called the Handbook of Service Science, Volume 2. 
from one chapter on AI. So there is one particular uh, example here that uh, a service encounter where AI acts as a support. Now, if you look at this, the interaction C stands for customer, FLE stands for frontline employees, and AI stands for artificial intelligence. So what's happening here is there is an interaction between customer, FLE. There is an interaction between FLE and AI. And for example, IBM Watson, most of us know who IBM Watson is, and it's used by physicians, doctors, to help with patient diagnosis, especially in the cancer care. And there are other examples for this. AI augmentation, so where AI acts as an augmentation. Now we close the loop. So now there is an interaction between FLE and customer, FLE and AI. So the firm is not existing here. For example, a robot assisted surgery, nurse and the care providing robots collaborating to assist patients. And this is very much uh, a thing in Australia, in the uh, adult care, in the aged care sector, where social robots are being accompanied with the real humans to help the aged uh, uh, people in the aged care facilities. And finally, some of the work that is performed by the AI. Now, chatbots are very common these days. The other last month only, just to give you an example, I took my car for service to a non-Toyota service center. Of course, you pay less if you take there. And I took there, they said that your water pump is gone. You need to replace your water pump. And I asked how much it is. He said $800. I said, can you give me a discount? He said, no, that's the price of the product. So we need to get that parts. And then I thought, let me check whether do I have the still the warranty on my, my car. And I went to Toyota webpage, a local webpage here, uh, uh, Toyota's, uh, and uh, a chatbot popped up. I just keyed in my requirements that I'm, I want to check my, my warranty. Do I have my warranty? I keyed in all my registration numbers and everything. And within 15 minutes, I get a call from my local Toyota service center. And he says, yes, your car is still under service, uh, under warranty. Get your car tomorrow. I got the car, saved my $800. So this is a series of interaction which was kickstarted by chatbot, followed up by employees, right? But again, it's uh, the primary interaction was performed by a typical AI form that is chatbot. So what is changing? Just give me a moment. So what is changing between service encounter 1.0 and service encounter 2.0? What has changed? So we are giving you two scenarios. We are giving you some examples between AC 1.0 and AC 2.0. What is the fundamental difference between AC 1.0 and AC 2.0? Now, as we said, the service encounter is one of the foundational constructs of services marketing. Likewise, interaction is one of the foundational premise of services marketing. What is service without interaction? So what has changed between AC1 and AC2 is interactions are changing. The way different entities in a service ecosystem used to interact has changed or are changing as a result of the intervention of technology or infusion of technology, right? So in AC1.0, if you look at, we have these primary three types of interactions. So we have a human to human interaction that is customer to employees, we have human to firm interaction that is customer to firm and we have again human to firm and that human is employees to firm. So these were the three primary interaction happening in SE 1.0. Most of the research that appeared in the mid 80s, late 80s, early 90s, mid 90s were around service encounter 1.0. Now, if you look at Parashuraman Zit Mulberry's serve call, which appeared in, I think, late 80, early 90s, that was around uh, serve call, was around service encounter 1.0, where most of these were around like human to human to firm interaction and customer to firm and employee to firm. Of course, they did have some questions around the, the, the computers and stuff like that, but primarily it was service encounter 1.0. But fast forward, service encounter 2.0, what is the difference? Here, if you see human to human interaction still is there. 
But what has changed is the human to technology interaction. More and more humans. Now this human could be your customer. This human could be your employees. They are interacting more and more with technology. And I see, and what amuses me, it's like a magic, is the interaction between technology and technology. And that's why I, I, I had to highlight this. And this was completely missing, at least at the front end of the services where the customer interacts with the company. The, the interaction between technologies and technologies. Now, if anybody's interested in this type of a work, Hoffman and Novak did some fantastic work uh, published in Journal of Consumer Research recently and one another paper in Journal of Academy of Marketing Science. And they did a fantastic job of teasing this technology or object. They call it object experience. So O2A is object to object interaction. And this is a fantastic addition to our service encounter 1.0 which leads us to the present times where technologies are interacting with technologies. You think of the, your, your platform based businesses. Think of Airbnb, how you book a cab today and how we used to book a cab before uh, before your Ola Uber kind of uh, activity came into the business, right? So how we used to do, we pick up a phone or we hail a taxi. Today you take out your phone, key in the address, and the taxi arrives. So there is a whole lot of technology to technology interaction happening in the market, in service uh, kind of a ecosystem, which needs our attention, our means service researchers attention. And that's the key differentiator between service encounter 1.0 and service encounter 2.0. So how do we define? Again, I go back to Bart Lavier's work on Service Encounter 2.0, and they define Service Encounter 2.0 as any customer company interaction that results from a service system that is comprised of interrelated technologies, human actors, digital environments, and the processes involved. Yeah. So here he captures in, in a nutshell, this definition captures all sorts of interaction incorporating technology here, digital environments. The point to take here, note is that technology plays a central role and technology is conceded to be an actor in the value co-creation or value creation phenomena. Now, those of you who are interested in service dominant logic, the refined versions of service dominant logic does use this term actor and technology is conceded to be another important actor when it comes to value creation and or value co-creation. So technology plays a key role when it comes to service delivery. I'm not going to play this video, but those who are interested in this, there's a nice little clip on YouTube by Amazon Go, and that is proposed to be the future of retail business, where you don't need any any human interface or any sort of a self-service technology. You just walk into the store, you don't need to scan also. There is an automatic scanner. You just walk in, get your stuff, walk out of the store, and the transaction happens seamlessly. And I, I, I cannot emphasize enough the seamless nature of Service Encounter 2.0. And that is only possible with connected technologies. So there is an emergence, and this is again related to a stream of work that's published in the last five to seven years. There is an emergence of a, a new category of services which they call as smart services. So for example, your health monitoring device, your family home monitoring services, your monitoring of industrial equipment, and countless examples are there. And this paper in Harvard Business Review, again, Alman, how do I pronounce this? Alman Dinger and Lombreglia, 2005. When we were doing our work, we found that these were the guys who for the first time defined this category of services, which is called smart services. And the, the critical difference is real-time data collection, continuous communication, and interactive feedback. These were the things. And you are able to sense your surroundings. And all of these technologies that we mentioned in this example have this feature. So they created this whole new category of services, which is smart services. Some papers call it interactive services. Some papers call it tech-enabled services. But I think smart services is nicely defined by these authors and later on also there's some work in general service research uh, which lays support to this idea of smart services this is uh, like disney's magic band 
and Nike Plus. It's a classic example. Nike Plus is a classic example. Again, there is a beautiful clip on YouTube about what Nike Plus is. So I often ask my students in the class, we do this activity that whether Nike Plus is a product, a service or an experience, right? And we'll have over 10, 15 minutes of heated discussion that what is Nike Plus? But at the end of the day, Nike Plus is not a shoe, right? Nike Plus is some sort of a, a product which is connected to everything, to your exercise device, to your mobile apps, to your social media. So it's a classic example of a product, oblique service, oblique experience that connects everything together. So that seamlessness is captured beautifully by Nike Plus. So some of these ideas when we were developing and we wanted to test it, uh, we did a paper in technological forecasting and social change where we tried to conceptualize this whole idea of smart customer experience. So when those guys in Harvard Business Review and General Services uh, Service Research they created this new category called smart service. Then we are saying that if there is a new category of services called smart service, which is heavily influenced by technology, then is there a way to understand customer experience through a new lens? So we try to conceptualize customer experience and we call this as SCE or smart customer experience. So if you are interested in that, possibly you can download that paper and have a read. But what we do in this paper is we define that smart retailing as a, a category and we call smart retailing as an interactive and connected retail system which supports the seamless management of different customer touch points in such a way that the customer experience across different touch points are personalized and optimized. So again, there are three key uh, points in this definition. One is the seamlessness, the connectedness of the different touch points and the personalized service delivery. These are the key features of smart retailing. And we also define smart customer experience. I'm not going to read it, but some of the features of smart customer experience as personalization, interaction, real time monitoring, perceived control and relative advantage. But we did create a table in that. Uh, so one of the reviewers came back and they said that it's, it's good to see that you are defining smart retailing but can you differentiate smart retailing from e-retailing? And by that time, mid 2000, late 2000, we had this paper by Parashuraman uh, and his colleagues again on e -surf call, which was done in the context of electronic services. So we have a clear research line developing in that space of e-commerce, e-retailing, online uh, retailing and stuff. So they said that, can you differentiate e-retailing with smart retailing, the idea that you were proposing? And we, we tried to differentiate this based on four characteristics. One was space, the technology use, the nature of interaction, the nature of experience, and how the service is being provided. Now, the critical difference to us as uh, uh, between us, the authors was that e-retailing or electronic retailing and online retailing is primarily a digital phenomena, right? And there is no doubt about it. But smart retailing is somewhere uh, a, a phenomena where we are trying to bridge the digital and the physical. It's neither digital nor physical, or it's kind of a, a, a fluid state between digital and physical. That's the way we wanted to differentiate. And there was a recent paper by Kavadai and his colleagues in general service management, where they conceptualized similarly that what is smart service again, and they along the similar lines, they also differentiate traditional services to e-services to smart services, and they use similar kind of a characteristic feature. But if you look at the technologies used here, again, the technology is the primary technology for electronic retailing is your websites. But when it comes to smart retailing, you have smartphones, you have application on your smartphones, and you have innumerable sensors that goes on, which captures the, your environment data about the customer and the transaction and a heap of other data. The nature of interaction, if you look at here, the primary interaction is between customer and the web store, customer and the customer. Look at the interaction in the context of smart retailing. So I'm interacting with the retailer, between the customers, with the products, and there is a machine to machine kind of an interaction happening. So there is a clear difference between 
this whole idea of smart retail service or smart service and the way we conceptualize electronic service and traditional service. So we argued in this work that if there is a new category evolving and there is a rationale to differentiate this, then we need to look at one of the very critical elements in services, which is customer experience through a different lens. So we need to measure it differently. We need to define it differently. And that's what we did in that paper. But why do we bother? Now we have spent about 40 minutes understanding SE1, SE2, why, uh, the differences, the different conceptualizations. But why do we need to bother? What is in it for us to take home, right? Now we need to bother because relationship marketing theory, services marketing theory clearly tells us that relationships and value creations are not a one-time phenomena. Relationships and value creations are a result of a series of service encounters with the firm. So when I say service encounters, series of encounters, for example, if you want to book a movie ticket, how many encounters you go through? Depending on the type of customers, you go through more than one encounters to buy your ticket and finally go and watch the movie and experience that that movie uh, viewing phenomena, right? So what we are saying is each positive experience and some uh, each positive service encounter is like a micro experience, right? And when you have this one positive experience, two positive experience, three positive experience. So like when you sum it up, summation of micro experiences gives you a macro experience, which is the customer experience here we are talking about. So at every touch point, so the way to understand is if I'm interacting through app based, I have an interaction. If I'm interacting through website, I have an interaction. If I'm into uh, uh, an experience, if I'm interacting at a retail store with a self-service technology, I have an interaction. So every touch point, the customer is interacting with the company. Now, it's the job of the company to make sure that all these experiences are consistently positive because a sum together or a summation of all of these micro experiences leads us to a macro positive customer experience. Why does it matter? Because there is enough empirical evidence to show that positive service encounter leads to positive quality perceptions about your service, right? Positive service encounter has a positive impact on your customer satisfaction levels. A positive service encounter has a positive impact on your willingness to continue. Now, I do not know of any company who does not want a steady stream of customers in the long run, right? So if I can create every micro experience, a positive micro experience, then I can make sure that my macro experience is positive. Why? Because we want a loyal base of customers. And there is again empirical evidence to show that loyalty and profitability of firm has some sort of a correlation going on. Right. If you look at the service profit chain research, if you look at the work done by Frederick Reichold on uh, on customer loyalty, there is empirical, strong empirical evidence to show that customer loyalty has a positive correlation with firm profitability. So it goes back again to show the importance of managing every positive, every micro experience, every touch point, or in a layman's term, whenever I'm interacting with any touch point of an organization, the company's job is to make sure that that experience is a good experience, plain vanilla. So that's the reason we need to bother. Now we carried on with that research and we recently published a paper again in the retail industry about consumer computer interaction and the in-store technology in retail industry. Here we applied motivation, opportunity, ability theory. We compared two country data, Australia and India. It's a very interesting read. You should be able to get this paper. If you don't get it, then I can send it to you if anybody is interested. And we were uh, very happy to see a series of papers by Greywall and his colleagues in the same space of in-store technology and the future of uh, technology and marketing in jams and others uh, in general retailing. So we, we are taking this work forward again to do some quality work to move to the higher level journals. There's another one published in the same journal, Journal of Marketing Management recently, where we 
we coined a new idea called the rise of smart consumers. And this, uh, in this paper, we extended the Mary Jo Bittner's concept of service scape. And in the context of smart service environment, So in the service, in the smart service, uh, can you hear me? Can anybody give me a thumbs up that you can still hear me? Uh, yes, it's good. Okay. okay, my headphone ran out of power, so I had to use the other one. Sorry for that. So in this paper, a journal of marketing management, what we did was we coined a new term called the smart consumers. And here we extended the idea of Mary Jo Bittner, that is smart service scape of 1992. And we say that we are applying that in the context of smart service environment. And we applied uh, stimulus organism response framework to test that idea of uh, smart service scape. So that's a beautiful paper. If you're interested, you can go through. But how do we define smart consumers? Uh, what, how do we, we conceptualize this idea of smart consumers? And we say that smart consumers have some uh, a typical characteristic. For example, smart consumers are well-informed, smart consumers are connected, smart consumers are aware, and smart consumers are ready to share and participate and engage with voluntary activities which benefits the other actors in the ecosystem. Now, for example, if you ask this question to yourself, are you a smart consumer in this present, say, retail sector or banking sector, at least in the financial services sector? Yes, I am. I consider to be myself to be a smart consumer because I'm always on. So the, the shortest way of remembering smart consumer is a consumer who is always on, right? And he's connected, he's well informed, so that he can decide and he's happy to leave feedback on different social media platform for others to benefit from their transaction right now these customers and what we say is smart consumers engage both in the co-production and the co-creation of value and they are at the heart of today's smart environment when i say smart environment it's an environment that is a connected environment enabled by technology, right? So all of these is leading to the generation of this whole idea called smart service system. Again, this is the term that uh, we took from Handbook of Service, uh, uh, Handbook of Service Science, Volume Two. There is a chapter on smart service systems, and I was very fascinated by, on reading this uh, chapter because there is a big literature on service design and service systems, and I was very intrigued to read this, this book chapter on smart service system. And I thought that the way our research is moving, this book chapter has a lot to offer to us, right? In terms of conceptualizing our work for the future. So how, how they define smart service, again, is beautiful. If you look at this, again, it's a triangle. And if you look at this triangle, you have things here. Things are technological objects. It could be a, a smart device on your wrist. It could be a smart car automated like uh, auto car or this provider could be anybody, a company or a host. Now, when we applied this to the context of say, platform business. So for example, so earlier we had things. Now let us see, instead of things, we have platforms. So this platform could be your Airbnb. This platform could be your, your Ola. This platform could be your Uber and then the service providers, the hosts, right? So this is in the context of say Airbnb service system. Now you can apply this in the context of B2B service system. This is more of a B2C service system, right? So this, this is so intriguing. There's a lot of research ideas in this book chapter. If anybody is interested, it's by Lim and Maglio, but we are trying to map our work with this so that we can take it forward. And one beautiful thing you will see here is this two way two way uh, uh, arrows where you have a data collection ability here and then there is an information that goes from this. So these customers are more of a smart customers. 
who are well informed, right? So it's a beautiful application of a traditional triangular service triangle kind of a framework, which we are still applying in the context of smart service system. So that kind of brings us to the end of first half of our presentation, but we will take it further. So in the first half, what we try to do, we try to establish the idea of service encounter. We try to establish that there is a nice movement from service encounter 1.0 to service encounter 2.0. There is a nice movement because of the impact of technology, and there's a lot of research streams coming out of this. We just shared some of the ideas. I'm sure there are more that we can debate and we can and pursue further. But there is a big debate, and most of us who are working in this space know that there is a debate on tech versus touch. What is more important? Whether tech is more important or touch is more important, or do we need both? So that debate is already there. This, this idea of industry 4.0 and uh, is bringing this idea to the fore. So it's there in the academic research, it's there in the business press, it's there in the political circle, wherever you go, tech versus touch is there, right? And I came across this case uh, uh, of Fabio. Fabio is a, a, is a service robot which was installed or commissioned at one of the Scottish retailers. We recently did a case study which is under review with one of the colleagues from Jindal uh, Global University in India. And this case study is under review at one of the case publication houses. Now the story is beautiful here. The story is Fabio was commissioned at a retail store and it was supposed to help customers in locating stuff in the retail stores and providing more information. That was primarily the job of Fabio, if I'm not mistaken. But Fabio was decommissioned very soon as a result of customers getting frightened with the, the, the Fabio, the robot, and customers were not getting right kind of information in many occasions, right? So that there were some issues with the algorithm or with the way the robot was behaving with the customer. So what the company thought, they decommissioned robot. Now, a, a typical phenomena started happening after Fabio was decommissioned. The employees who were sharing the retail floor with Fabio, they started missing Fabio. Now, this is a typical human nature. You start miss, missing your fellow colleagues, right? So possibly employees started treating Fabio as a fellow colleague in that retail store, right? They started missing Fabio. And that is the puzzle that we are proposing in the case study. But what is there for us as a service researcher? What do we want to tease out so that we can help the companies who had to decommission it? I'm not a technologist, but I leave the technology part, the algorithm part for the experts. But through the lens of service research, can we do something so that we can help the companies to understand this typical phenomena that the employees are missing the robot? Robots are not delivering the service that they were supposed to deliver. So there is a lot of unanswered question that is there. But in this idea of tech versus touch, one big question that is asked is, is your job safe? When I say your, is the employee's job safe? Is the real employee's job safe? Or there is a talk that robots are going to take your job, right? Days are not far that when I want to go and teach in my class, a robot will accompany me. I very much want a robot to help me uh, at least mark my exam papers, my projects, right? And I will do the rest, right? So what, what, what is the future? We don't know. So the most of the debate is revolving around substitution, that robots are going to take away our job. The robot automation is going to make many employees uh, redundant, so on and so forth. So there is a fear psychosis happening in the market, in our economies, right? At the same time, there is another group of people who are saying that tech and touch can work together. And this is where we put our money. As a group of researchers, our fundamental proposition is that yes, there are negative effects, but if we hold the positive side of it, tech and touch can work together. 
so technology or robots or ai and machine learning can complement or augment the abilities of the employees so that the end user the customer is benefited and hence the company in the long run right so we are in that space where we are proposing in some of the ongoing research that tech and touch together has the highest potential to create value and this proposition those of you who will read this book the ai advantage you will find tom devonport beautifully makes this point that tech and touch working together is the future the rise of ai machine robots this calls for a new type of collaboration there is a lot of research in organizational behavior human resource management that human human collaboration how humans can work with humans right the job design pay design and things like that there is a whole heap of research on there but there is very less research on human machine collaboration that how fabio and the real human employee can work together there is a very less knowledge on that so consistent with huang et al 2019 and jarahi 2018 we propose in our research that it's not a race against the machines if we we are not fighting against the machine this is a race with the machines and we will win it's a if we fight with the machines so it's about extending and augmenting human capabilities not replacing them and this is again we are borrowing from thomas devonport's book the ai advantage that we can always help the employer uh, the human employees by extending and augmenting their capabilities so what we are doing in some of our work is we are looking through the lens of augmentation right if you remember at the beginning we said there are four roles of technology one is augmentation two substitution three network facilitation and four transformative role we are primarily looking through the lens of augmentation and transformative or transformative service research right so what's happening and again i'm closely following roland ross work because in the last 2 to 3 years he uh, rust and his colleagues have done fantastic work conceptualizing this idea of artificial intelligence and how is it going to help service researchers and service economy so what they say in their recent california management review paper and journal of services research paper is that most of the technologies machine learning ai robots they are very good at these two technology uh, these two types of intelligence mechanical intelligence and thinking intelligence they human ability is very limited compared to machine abilities when it comes to mechanical intelligence and thinking intelligence they can outpace us but when it comes to this bit even now technologies are not that advanced so that an ai will have a feeling right the empathy part is still missing as per the existing research so most of the technologies are so good at this but what we are good at is this feeling part the empathy part and this relates back to the self call phenomena one of the dimensions of self call is empathy and empathy is kind of coming back in business in the service research in service kind of a phenomena right so what their proposition is let the machine do mechanical job let the machine do the thinking job the hard labor and we the human employees we the humans let us take the part of serving with feeling serving with a smile serving with empathy and he proposes roland rust and his colleagues proposes that we are at the cusp of emergence of a new type of economy which they call as feeling economy right about 10 15 20 years ago pine and gilmour proposed this idea of experience economy now feeling or emotion is so integral to that idea of experience economy of pine and gilmour if anybody has not read that book it's one of the seminal books service researchers should read is my personal view is the experience economy right and i take a leaf out of that again that yes experience economy is relevant important but what part of experience the emotion part of it so machines will take the technological part we the humans take the feeling part the empathy part and this is how we come together we bond together 
and we create value for the customers and other stakeholders in the business, in the service ecosystem, right? Some of these faces must be familiar to you. This is Sophia. She was the first robot to feature on this magazine cover page. The YouTube is full of videos and interviews with Sophia. And the other day my daughter was saying, Dad, do you know Sophia? I said, of course I know Sophia. We are doing some research on Sophia's friends and families. So of course I know Sophia. And robots are everywhere. Recently we started doing some work in India and I hear that some of the financial services providers, especially banks, they are installing in a pilot testing phase some robots at the front desk, right? I'm not naming the names because of privacy issues, but yes, that is a phenomena also happening in the developing economy like India. So robots are coming, they are there. It's not a time to fear them, it's the time to work with them and optimally utilize their abilities. <coughs> so if you look at what are the sectors that are being affected by this sort of technologies like AI and robots. And you, you start from retail, healthcare, aged care, consumer durables, hospitality, medical training, defense, farming, and even prostitution. There is no sector which is untouched or unaffected by robotic technology or AI technology, right? So we have no option but to dig deeper and tease out the research questions. So I will leave you with more research questions or more questions than answers because most of the work that we are doing in this space is at the conceptualization phase or at the mid-level of development. So we do not have the answers ourselves, so we cannot share that answers with you. But certainly I can leave some questions for us so that all of us can work in this space. So we are primarily working in the retail space. We are also working in the healthcare space and we are working that is not mentioned here, the financial services space in three different projects on service robots. So we hope to make a contribution in this space in the next two to three years window. So if you look at service literature and technology infusion, primarily research is happening around artificial intelligence in services, Internet of Things, where we have also contributed with a, a series of papers, service frontline and technology, how frontline employees are and technology can work together, and robotics and service experience. So technology infusion research or service impact of technology on service and counter research is primarily happening at these four fronts. I've just quoted some papers. I'm sure there are many more that are there, but these are some of the initial work that has appeared in the last two to three years in this space. We are doing some work in this field. Now, what are the work that we are doing? I'm not getting into the details, as I said. In one of the research teams, we are examining using service dominant logic lens that how humans, FLEs or frontline employees and robots can work together to create value. So here we have already done the qualitative phase of the study and that will inform our quantitative phase so we are using a mixed method to answer that question. And the primary research question is that how humans and robots can work together. And SD Logic has provided us that platform to conduct that research. One of my PhD students, he's examining adoption related issues with service robots. Now this is not a typical adoption phenomena we are, uh, we are examining because robots and AI are not the same as other technologies. They are a different type of technology. So traditional TAM models or UTOUT models or behavioral reasoning theory type of theories are not going to take us any further, right? Or take us too far. So we need a fresh lens. We need something new. And I'm, I'm glad I have a PhD student who is working in that space along with us. So only time will tell whether we are able to push that boundary on adoption of service robots. I have another student who is working in the space of smart retailing using the ANT theory or actor network theory. And that is again kind of at the initial phase. And this is the beauty. This is close to my heart, the last one. We are applying quantum decision theory. Not many of you know that my first two degrees are in physics. 
I've studied nuclear science before I started studying marketing science. So quantum mechanics and quantum physics is always my first love. And I always see that how I can bring physics and marketing together. Maybe once I become a full professor, I will try that again, but not before that. But certainly along with a colleague from UK, we are trying to apply quantum decision theory to model the smart service systems. So we are arguing that classical decision theories may not be ideal to understand customer decision making in the smart environment or smart service system. So this is again at a very initial phase, but certainly we are making good progress on that project. So I'm sorry I cannot discuss much about this because all of these are at the uh, stages of development. But as I promised that I will leave with, with a large number of unanswered questions. <coughs> One of that is very critical that under what circumstances do customers prefer service delivery from an AI FLE? For example, a robot versus a human FLE. So what is that boundary condition? When do I prefer a human versus a machine? Are customers willing to accept AI as a substitute for FLEs? And what are the conditions? Under what conditions I'm happy to accept an AI at a bank or at a hotel or at an university where I teach? Who? is to blame. If something goes wrong with the service delivery, whom to blame? The customer, the firm, or the, the, the company who has created the technology? Who to blame? No one knows that. And this is a classic issue with uh, the, the cars, self-driven cars, right? That if the, that car faces some sort of an accident on a freeway, then who is responsible? Is it the driver? Is it the car manufacturer or who? Whether SLEs are ready to accept AI as fellow employees. This is a classic thing that this research question came out from our Fabio case study. And we were fortunate that we did that case study. That whether SLEs are ready to accept AI as fellow employees, right? We often spend a lot of time as marketers to understand B2C and the customer level. But I'm happy to see that a number of high profile researchers in this space are spending a lot of energy on frontline employees and I'm closely following them as a learner, as a learner centric person to understand from their research that how they're addressing this organizational frontlines and frontline employees and technology interface. So this is a critical question for us to answer. Uh, going further, do AI FLEs generate customer discomfort and threaten customers' human identity perception? Again, this question directly comes from our Fabio case study. Impact of AI robots on customer and FLE well-being. Now we spend a lot of time on examining customer well-being, but how about FLE well-being, frontline employees well-being? How is this new technology forms impacting people? Now think about coronavirus example, how it has Within a matter of one week, or within a span of one week, we had to wind up everything from face to face to digital delivery, right? So what toll did it take on frontline employees like us, right? So I'm, I'm treating myself as a frontline employee who is delivering teaching service upfront, right? How, how did it impact? Nobody cared about that, right? At least in my opinion. How do we resolve the personalization and privacy paradox? So at one point we discussed this, that technology brings a lot of positives, at the same time negatives. So there is a paradox which we call the personalization and privacy paradox. When is it too much, right? When is too much of personalization and where is that line? We don't know. And whether classical decision-making theories are relevant in this new smart environment. What is the role of quantum decision theory in this new environment? So there is a lot of unanswered question. That means there is a lot of scope for all of us to do more research. Certainly, I'm involved with a number of good people, highly productive people. We are working together. Only time will tell whether we are successful in taking that to bigger good journals. So my proposition and our team's proposition is let us work with AI and robots and let us change the world one paper at a time. Thank you very much for having me. I hope it was useful to some extent.
Thank you very much. Namaste. Uh, thank you very much, uh, dear Prof. Sanjit uh, Roy. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your uh, contribution and uh, your effort. Uh, right now, uh, Dr. Sanjit Roy uh, will be answering uh, your questions. If you have any questions, you can open uh, uh, your mic and ask uh, the questions. Please, after asking your questions, uh, please, uh, uh, please uh, close, uh, close it. Uh, uh, doctor? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah. Hello. Hey. Thanks for, for this valuable presentation. It adds a lot, in fact. Um, thank you, thank you. Uh, but I need to ask you about uh, how can you see social media platforms uh, meeting the criteria to be considered as a smart service system? I'll say it again. Okay. How can you see social media platforms meeting mm -hmm. the criteria to be considered a smart service system? I'm not sure I understood your question, but if I am understanding, you're trying to say that whether social media platforms can be considered as a smart service system, is it? Yes, 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 you're right. Okay. Right, right. So I think we need to identify who are the parties and what are the interactions going on. So if you look at the smart service system framework that we discussed, so we have a thing, so we have the technology, and we have the customer, and we have the firm. So there is a three-way interaction happening between the technology, the customer, and the firm. So if that three-way interaction is happening, at least as per that idea of smart service system, we may consider that as a smart service framework. So you are meaning that uh, you mean that um, it can go uh, through the social media platforms, uh, websites, Google websites, uh, mm -hmm. for example, YouTube pages. I mean, they can deliver value through. They can be considered a smart service system. See, we need to go to the drawing board and first identify who are the entities, service entities, and we need to put down the service entities and identify the interactions that are happening. A system is nothing but interaction, multiple interaction between multiple parties that is happening that we call it a system, right? So okay. do you identify? So when you identify the different entities, then you look for the interaction between the entities. And once you get that, you can club it under the umbrella of smart service system. OK, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Dr. Faizan Ali. Um, yes. Um, uh, thank you, Dr. Sanjit. Uh, my name is Faizan. I'm an assistant professor Hi, from University of South Florida. Uh, wonderful presentation. And I see there's a, a lot of overlap in what you are doing in uh, retail sector uh, mm -hmm. compared to what we are doing in hospitality and tourism. So uh, wonderful presentation and thank you. Uh, my question, um, actually not a question, but an observation, what you were talking about, mm -hmm. Fabio. Um, and again, it's, you know, open for discussion. So do you think that what happened with Fabio where people were uh, starting to miss Fabio is because of anthropomorphic uh, features of Fabio? Because here in U.S. and Target, they recently installed uh, screens, right? So basically those screens are doing exactly what Fabio was doing, provide information mm -hmm. or help customers to locate the products. So I just mm -hmm. assume that if they remove the screens, people may not miss the screens. But I mm -hmm. think people are missing Fabio because it looks like a human, right? It's anthropomorphic. So what do you think right. about that? See, again, I think recently I was reading a post on the surf sig recently, I think today morning only, about perceived humanness, right? Uh, there is a, a Nordic researcher, I guess, if I'm not making a mistake, who has a commentary on that, that people whether people like that humanness in a robot or they don't like it so what is that point beyond which they don't like that humanness so i'm sure anthropomorphism or anthropomorphic characteristics are critical when it comes to that me missing another human being so it does have the human features and probably that is one example the other could be the emotional contagion kind of a literature that also looks at our emotional labor kind of a literature, which does again indicate in that space that when I share the same space with humans, 
I develop some sort of a unknown kind of a relationship or some sort of an emotional connect with that human. So instead of a human, I have a technology here which looks like a human. So possibly anthropomorphism, possibly emotional contagion, uh, a type of a literature might have some indications, but uh, these are the two things that comes to my mind at the moment. Uh, right, thank you. And then one other thing, uh, uh, Sanjeev, is uh, yeah. you discussed a lot of um, literature, classic literature on services and how you can map smart services on top of it, right, which makes sense. Mm -hmm. Um, in my own literature review also, I haven't seen something um, about service failures. So service failure, we have a lot of literature, right? Uh, mm -hmm. What is service failure? How can you deal with that and all this? Mm -hmm. um, but have you come across anything that talks about what are the differences between regular service failures and smart service failures? Or how can mm -hmm. consumers cope with it? Uh, that's one. And the other thing, have you come across anything about how do consumers perceive value of smart services? Because smart services are supposed to be real time. Um, mm -hmm. A good example would be Google Maps, right? So let's say you are going somewhere, you put the destination in Google Maps, it shows you the, the best route. And then mm -hmm. let's say while you are driving, there's an accident or something, the Google algorithm automatically changes the route, giving you mm -hmm. the best route. So when mm -hmm. you re reach your destination, you probably do not appreciate what Google did on the back end because you didn't realize it. You know? mm -hmm. So now what mm -hmm. Google Map did it, they recently changed it. And now when they change the route, they give you some uh, a prompt on the screen saying that there's a best route available. Do you want to mm -hmm. say five minutes or 10 minutes or something mm -hmm. like that, mm -hmm. where you appreciate the value? So mm -hmm. for these two points, what do you think? A perceived value for smart services because it's real time. Maybe mm -hmm. consumers don't see it. And then mm -hmm. uh, how about smart service failures? Yeah, I think let me address the the failure first. Uh, we haven't, uh, I have never done work on service failure other than one paper that we did with one of the colleagues at European Journal of Marketing 2017, where we did uh, a paper on service failure and its emotional effect. But uh, certainly we are working through the lens of coping. So with colleagues from US and UK, we are looking at uh, the coping mechanism. So this technology might come with a lot of, uh, so there is a steep learning curve for some customers. And as a result of pandemic, there is a big dependence on technology, right? So when that type of technology fails, or when there is a high dependence on technology, how do we cope? So I'm doing more work on that space rather than the failure part of it. So. I don't spend much time on there. I spend more time on service delivery, but the closest that we are doing is this coping mechanism that how as individuals we emotionally cope with that particular technological that uh, uh, what do we said influx of technology in service delivery. So that is one part. The second part again, if you look at the initial part of my presentation, we did talk about the positive and the negative impact of technology. So when there is a positive impact, your, your Google map gives you all these beautiful destination. And if there is a jam, it wants you and it finds the alternate route. So I am creating positive value for you. So of course there is a need to do more research and I don't want to divulge more information, but certainly we should pick up a chat later on. We have found some work in that space uh, in the line of application of perceived value uh, in the in the space of smart service environment. Again, we are doing in the context of retailing, but it would be good to have a chat with you. And if you're interested, we can take it kind of a cross service kind of a comparison. So how it works in retailing vis-a-vis -vis tourism and hospitality. So there is some sure. application we are doing and we are extending Holbrook and Hirschman's work uh, uh, of 1980s on values. So there is some work but we are again basing on the foundational work on value and taking it to the uh, smart environment. Sure, thank you very much, Sanjit. I'll reach out to you later on and let's let's continue to chat about this. Thank you again. Yeah, of course, of course. Thanks, uh, Fezan. Hi again. Uh, uh, 
Eight. Hello, can Go I on. ask question? Yes. Yeah, yeah of course you were. Can I ask question? Yeah, go ahead. Yes, yes, I'm Tahir from China. Uh, uh, thank you so much for the wonderful presentation, Professor Sanjeev. Uh, you thank you. Dr. Fezan also mentioned the service encounter uh, and mostly the Professor Sanjeev also uh, just talk about on the value destruction. So being a pure marketer, uh, I, I published some of the paper on the brand hate. So how can we uh, uh, link this uh, service uh, encounter or uh, the the smart uh, service e smart service encounter with the brand hate and maybe the uh, uh, maybe the uh, dissatisfaction of the, the 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 negative outcome maybe the feeling is hate anger uh, like like these type of like a disconnection or revenge with the with the with this uh, service encounter failure professor yeah yeah i think see i i cannot tell you or rather i don't work in that space so i cannot suggest how to link these right so i'm sorry i'm not an expert in that space but one theory that probably would help you which one of my phd students was using when i was working in britain he used this theory called the attribution theory weiner's attribution theory so this attribution theory is has a number of propositions which you, you can probably have a look and see if there is anything in attribution theory which you can adopt and and try and connect this. That is that I'm just throwing it into the dark, but uh, I cannot help more than this. I'm sorry. Thank you so much. But being a being a, a, a reviewer of the of the wonderful journal, I just ask you that it is a promising research paper that uh, we can start work on these things or not. Because you know, being a desk rejection. Uh, as an associate editor, what what do you suggest that it is like we can uh, link the service encounter in 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 that particular area and link with the with the brand hate like uh, uh, with the negative feeling? Is that okay or not? I I just need little help from your side. Uh, see, this is not how we do research, uh, uh, or we are taught to do research. We try to come up with. Uh, uh, clear gaps. We try to identify gaps. Linking two constructs or two phenomena may not be the right starting point. That's me and my training telling you that I have two phenomena. One is brand head, one is service encounter or smart service encounter, and I'm trying to bring them together and trying to establish a link somehow and do a paper and trying to target a journal. That may not be my approach. I would rather look into service encounter research and the phenomena and try to understand the gap. So once I have a gap and then I look at the research question and the research gap and see what is the best way that I can address that gap. So I think that's how my training tells me rather than connecting constructs or connecting uh, 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 what is I say the phenomena. So I would suggest that look at the brand hate literature and see what has not been done or what has been done. What is the gap there? Look at service encounter and see what is the gap there and whether these two gaps have any possibility to come together as say possibly study one, study two and study three. This is a long shot I'm telling you, but you need to identify the gap and hence the research question before you set out to do any research and spend time, money, energy on doing your research and avoiding a desk Thank rejection because Thank papers so are desk much. rejected. Papers are desk rejected not only only based on there are so many reasons why papers are desk rejected. And one of the reasons is contribution that you are making, right? And the contribution comes from identification of gap and research questions. So that should be the starting point rather than linking the constructs. Does it make sense? Thank you so much. Sure. I think that uh, you have uh, done very well uh, with answer, answering uh, a lot of questions uh, there, uh, dear Prof. Uh, Sanjit Roy. So that, uh, so thank you very much. Uh, indeed, uh, so all that remains for me to say, 
uh, is thank you uh, everyone uh, that's join us and I thank you very much for uh, taking the time uh, I want to present uh, to us uh, today Dr. Sanjay Troy it's be really appreciated finally thank I you very much for having me thank you thank you very much I would like to thank you Dr. Sanjay Troy and uh, all my colleagues thank you take care thank you bye, thank, bye. You. thank you thank you dear prof thank you goodbye Good night.